you guys know the hand loading crowd and, and you're, you're part of that crowd. They tend to, they're small, but they're very vocal. And so what we get- well, Everyone's got an opinion and they're right. often not right. Uh, you know, right. like uh, uh, very loud, often wrong, never in doubt. And, right. and yeah. racked with OCD. Exactly. You know, so yeah. a difficult person. And you know, some of them just enjoy hand loading. I'm not gonna argue with those guys. If it's a hobby of yours yeah, and you just course. like doing it, go for it. I like tying flies occasionally, but it doesn't mean I want to do it every time I go fishing. <laughs> What's up, dude? What's happening? How are you? I'm fantastic, Jason. Are you? What, are yeah. you you're excited I'm about like, the. You're excited about this afternoon. I yes. Okay. It's gonna be orgasmic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Whoa! What yeah. kind of party is this? I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it'll it'll be. I was just talking to uh, Ron Dan. I was like, you know what? I can't wait till like eleven o'clock tonight. He goes, Why is that? He's like, because that's when like all the stragglers will have left the party, like the people who are showing up to show up. And the guys that actually want to be there, like that's when it was great last year. And I was like thinking everyone would be out, out of my house at like 10, but like the crew from like, even the crew from 10 till like 3 a.m. was awesome. Yeah. And like just having a blast, it, you know, it got a lot tighter. It was a cool part of I mean, it, just super eclectic. It started off as like, it was basically a party for our contractors. Like, and all the dudes that were like, just help us get our house when we moved down to Florida. They. You know, obviously it's Florida, supply chain issues. Everything was crazy. So many people moving down here, like you couldn't get anyone to work anything. So many of these guys were just super MAGA. We're like, dude, whatever you need. And so like I was literally, it was for them and their workers. And then it sort of, people started hearing about it and it grew. It was the most eclectic part. Like you had hourly wage, you know, like workers and like, you know, former head of national intelligence and three congressmen and four billionaires. And it was like, and everyone was intermingling on this. Like, it was the cool, like, I love seeing that. You know what I mean? It was like, that's good more of because- what you need uh, in life. And it was just sort of like, what is going on here? And so when some of those people just stayed till the end and it had some drinks in them, it was just really cool. So a couple of years ago, um, I was at your house uh, in Bridgehampton mm-hmm. um, for a party and uh, it gets to like nine o'clock at night. And, um, you know, I was, I was just tired of talking to people I didn't know. So I went in, in to my room, got a little bit of work done. And then about nine 45, I come back out and there's just, just a ton of people at your house and I'm walking around. I don't see you. I'm like, ah, oh, he's out on the porch smoking a cigar. And I go out there and you're not out there. Um, so I'm like, where the hell did he go? So I call you and you answer the phone. You're like, hello. And I'm like, what are you doing? And you go, I'm in bed. And I said, dude, there's like 150 people at your house. And, you're like, and you go, zero fucks. You, go, like, you go, dude, I thought you went to bed. I walked around <laughs> and you weren't anywhere. So like, I'm done. I'm not coming back out of my room. Um, so it's good. Like you like the parties where it's a mix of everybody. Um, well, I, I like a good mix of people, but I'm also like, you know, people don't get this because they're like, Don, I saw you on a stage and for an hour with a mic and 10,000 people like you can do like, what do you mean? You're basically a recluse. It's like, if I'm out of like my friend circle, like I, I almost want nothing to do with it. I can do it. I can fake it usually. And it's but not I, because I, you're impolite. I'm, no, it's just, it's just not for me. Like it's not your seen, personality. Like, I, I can disappear. Like when I got you know COVID, it was the greatest two weeks of my life. Cause I was like, I went to my cabin and I was by myself for, and the, the people are like checking in on me. Like, no dude, you like, you don't understand. Like. This is like the perfect scenario. Like I, I'm forced to not have to be around people. It's great. Well, this is going to be a fun afternoon. Yeah. Um, we have Pat Hogan here from True Velocity. He's coming to the party with his beautiful wife. And um, I'm surprised she's as pretty as she is just because I've met why, you a few times. Why would you say that? I've met you a few <laughs> times. I'm just going to say I'm a little bit surprised. I'm also Listen, surprised. I like people that overperform. There must be something that yeah. you don't see. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a... You're you a know. performer somewhere, buddy. That's right. Knock, um, knock that one out of the park. But uh, so... Um, I didn't realize that Scobie hates Pat. Um, yeah. I've so, earned it over yeah. years and so years of time. I try, I was like, okay, um, Scobie, you go, you and Pat go back. Uh, you guys have been friends for a while. So um, you and Don and Pat do the podcast. He's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like, oh, but you guys know each other. He's like, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Um, he's like, I don't want to host. I'm, and and uh, Scobie just, Scobie loves being a co-host and, and enjoying the conversation and things like that. I think I put them under too much pressure to- um, Performance anxiety. Yeah, I mean, it, plus it's hard when you're friends with somebody to yeah. act like you don't know about them and bring that kind of stuff out. And I don't know about you as well. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I currently work in marketing and communications for uh, an ammunition company by the name of True Velocity. Uh, I mean, we manufacture lightweight ammo. Uh, we'll get in. I'm sure we'll get into some detail on that. Um, but my relationship with Scobie in particular goes back, you know, 15 plus years. Uh, we spent a long time together um, at a company that is now called Outdoor Sportsman Group. Um, you know, the largest media holdings of of hunting shooting, fishing, outdoor-related uh, magazines, websites, television channels, et cetera. And uh, early on in that, in that tenure at, at OSG, um, I was working, I was managing North American Whitetail Magazine and their television properties, and Mike was running Peterson's Hunting. Uh, so we didn't have, a, we had occasional overlap there. Um, but over time, as we continued with the company, there was an opportunity um, to fill the publishing role for OSG's shooting portfolio, which is, you know, inclusive of Guns and Ammo magazine, Shooting Times, Firearms News. I mean, some of the, you know, some of the preeminent firearm per- periodicals in the world. You know, Guns and Ammo is one of the most wide- widely read publications, period, um, in the world. And so Mike and I actually filled uh, the role of our pre- predecessor, uh, Chris Agnes. He stepped away for another opportunity, and they decided in order to fill Chris's shoes, they needed two human beings. I'm not sure if that's Complimentary. So you're not uh, a performer there, right? Okay. You no. Know, yeah. uh, I can at least do. And not, half neither is Mike. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> just, just to be clear, you know. I'm not. I'm not sure how complimentary that was of Mike and I, but we filled the job together, and uh, I was his associate publisher. You know, as we ran those magazines for a couple of years, and um, and then shortly after that, you know, I, our paths kind of diverted. I ended up at uh, at True Velocity, helping launch that brand. Um, and introduce their ammunition to the to the world, and and then Mike ultimately ended up here, you know, with yeah. you guys. Yeah. So the first time I met you um, was at True Velocity, and Don and I came to Texas to check the place out. Um, we weren't working with, with you guys or anything. We just came to check out because we've heard these guys are doing some really cool stuff. So we we fly into Dallas and we come see you guys. And Don and I are both obvious nerds for this kind of stuff. And so when you're you know, development team, everybody's in the room telling us about everything. We start going really nerd on it and we realize how cool True Velocity is. And then you guys took us into the manufacturing side of the, uh, of your operation and we were blown away. I mean, it looked like, uh, NASA meets a operating room. Uh, it was just spick and span high tech. I mean, it was, it was the future. I mean, it was like we were looking at the future of ammo, really. Well, I had met, you know, Kevin Boskamp became a friend, CEO, uh, you know, years before that was telling me about it in the advent, I think before you even got there, Pat, like, and it was, I was like, man, and you know how, I mean, I, I take nerd on this stuff to a, to a whole new level. And when I started thinking about what, you know, what he was saying, I was like, oh my God, you know, playing with the internal dimensions of, yeah. you know, I don't want to call it brass anymore because it's not really brass. Right. Everyone knows it as brass, but you guys are doing it with a polymer. And I was just like, oh my God, like what you can do with heat, what you can do with, you know, minimizing powder, especially when you're talking about the shortages that you face here while achieving the same velocities without, uh, uh, like- Or subsonic, uh, controlling yeah. that internal dimension My for whole subsonic. brain was just going insane. And then, you know, it, again, when you when you hear about it, even as a, as a guy that's as into it as a, I am and hand loading for precision long range and these kinds of things, and like even, you know, do, doing the old Ventress thing back in the day. And like, I was like, come on, no way. And then when I saw it, I'm like, oh my God, they're actually doing it. And then, and then we know, shot it. Then we shot it. And that's what I was like. We didn't shoot it with oh. you guys. You guys sent us some ammo to test out. And I, I called. I sent Don some ammo to test out. Well, I got some. You guys sent me. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it doesn't matter. If you're shooting groups like this, it's, you yeah. know, it's. Uh... You, you guys sent me some ammo to test out. And I called Don. I was like, dude, this stuff is half inch uh, out of this um, Springfield waypoint. And you must have pulled one or two of them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. That's what, that's what I was like. And again, I, you know. That's my world. Like, I, that's what I do every, I shoot thousands of rounds of center fire a year. And I was like, okay, come on. Like, there's no way it's going to shoot as well as some of these things. And, and like, uh, especially in the numbers like, you know, ESSD, that's where I was sort of most shocked. Because, you know, that's where, you know, you, you, there's plenty of sort of good match stuff that shoots half inch at 100 yards. Explain ESSD really like, quick. Let's like, just basically, you know, the the extreme spread of your velocities over a string of rounds, right, would be ES. The SD is the standard deviation of that. So basically measuring the same thing. It's how how extreme it is. And at 100 yards, it may not matter. You can have, gut, you know, bullets that will group. You can shoot a five-shot group inside a dime. But at 1,000 yards, if your extreme spread is wide, the difference in velocity is essentially the Effects difference drop. in time of flight. So if one's getting there because it's shooting, you know, let's call it 3,100 feet per second, and one's shooting 3,050 Right. At 50 feet per second over, you know, close to a second of flight time, it just creates a lot of vertical. So you end up with groups that are just very oblong. 
And so minimizing that allows you to actually maximize precision, even if it's precise at 100. So yeah, I mean, long story short, it's very consistent. Incredibly yeah, consistent. Any, anytime you get past 400 meters, that's where you really start to see the consistency of your muzzle velocities play out, right? Yeah. Uh, and so when you look at, you know, typical brass case ammunition, really, I mean, the only place you're going to find single digit standard deviations and muzzle velocity is, is the guy who's hand loading rounds in his, right. his basement or his loading room or whatever. Um, it's, that's not to say you don't ever see it with, you know, factory brass ammo, but it is not often. For yeah. me, for me, it's, you know, and I, I have enough guns to say this, like it's one in 25 guns. Yeah. You know, tw- one in 20 guns will have like single digit, you know, SD with factory. And again, most of those guns, cause I, I'm blessed to not really, I don't shoot a lot of shitty guns like you know they could all be sub moa guns but they're not going to get that sd for for distance and so i'm missing shots not because i'm actually missing shots or making bad wind calls i'm missing shots because my ammo is not capable of being consistent enough vertically yeah Uh, Yeah. and i mean there's a lot that goes into that um and we can dig into it but you know it's not just the design of the product it's the manufacturing process as well and i think that's what really differentiates our our company our brand from traditional ammunition. And, you know, I had, I had very much the same experience the first time I, I set foot in True Velocity's facility. And that's probably five or six years ago now. Um, I, I went to the facility with it, you know, from a journalistic perspective and looked at it and honestly was probably one of the bi- biggest skeptics they had ever had walk through the door. Yep. Um, I mean, in my mind at the time, it was gimmicky. Plastic, really. Gimmicky. I mean, this, this stuff's going to be cheap. It's not going to function right. Um, but you get there, you see it, and then and then you take it one step further and start thinking about the implications of it. You know, just yeah. just weight reduction alone for military. Uh, well, that that was the sort of sort of cool factor that hooked me. But then again, thinking about again internal dimensions, yeah. you know, things you can't do with brass. Uh, so much of your accuracy, precision, SD also comes from neck tension. Right. I mean, it's not always just powder charge. And again, when you're you know running Black Hills of your military, or whatever, I mean, the plant's been around for six. 60 something, you know what I mean? Yeah, and Same manufacturer, like they're using like leather belts to still move stuff around. Like, right, and, and they've got know, a new facility, yeah, right? That's one speaking. constraining component, you know, the neck tension, what you can do with a polymer, you know, engineered around. I mean, just think of how much more precise you can get that than, you know, something that's essentially blown out and extruded, uh, you know, in terms of consistency there. Like it, it's, it's, it, it, it's the future of- It really you know, is the future of, and, and that's why I mentioned it felt like we were in the future of ammo. Yeah. And I, I, I do think that, that that you guys are really on to the, the edge of where this, this stuff can go. And I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, we took some 308 ammo to Africa. And it was, you guys mentioned, I said, I would love for one of us to be the first person to take a big game animal with this. And you're like, well, Donnie Vincent's already taken some of this stuff out. And I was like, all right, well, we're heading out of town soon. We're taking it. Um, and the first person that I know of, and Donnie can claim that he was the first person to kill something with, but it's either Donnie Vincent or it's Cole Hauser, who is uh, Rip Wheeler from Rip. Yellowstone. Um, he shot a wildebeest from like 300 yards with it. Um, well, so he's got first international for sure. Though. We can first international for sure, and we can let those two guys disagree with it, and Cole will just throw them through a plate glass window. Yeah, I, I say we put Cole and, and Danny in the same room and, and, yep. and let them duke it out. Let them duke it out. So, um, but you know, the the reality of it is, is that we started kind of, we were we were impressed beyond impressed. We started uh, preaching the true velocity message, and we got a lot of people. DMs coming into Instagram. This stuff actually works. A buddy of mine that's up uh, up where I live, he is a real reloading nerd. Uh, he came to the office and asked if he could have a box, so I gave him a box. He had the same experience that I've had. And so we've established that it's accurate. Uh, we know what's out there now. What do we have? We have 308 and 556. 556 and uh, 223 Remington. Those are yep. both coming out uh, for commercial availability probably very beginning of 2023. We're going to launch it at SHOT Show. Um, six, five Creedmoors in the works, 50 BMG, 338 Norma. Um, and then probably the one I'm most excited about is our 6.8 TVC round, uh, which was a cartridge designed um, to meet some of the demands for the U.S. Army. Um, that thing's going to be, I, and I've been talking with Kevin about that. That thing's going to be badass. They've and got, they've, I asked Pat last time I talked to him, I said, do you guys have reamers for this? And he's like, yep, we have the reamers for it. So you can start cutting chambers. Yeah, I mean, I, we have reamer kits, you know, roughers, finishers, incremental gauges, sampling. I mean, it's kits are ready to go in our facility right now. And we started about a year ago, reaching out to, you know, some of the preeminent rifle manufacturers in the industry 
to get them going on development of 6.8 chambered rifles. And so you've got, I mean, there's a laundry list of them, but some of the ones I'd mentioned right off the bat, Daniel Defense is working on a rifle, um, Rock River, uh, LMT. Um, what bolt face is that going to be? 473. So this is what's really interesting about yeah. that cartridge. And this is where we start. And this that. is where you can do more with polymer than you. When you say 473, explain to people what normal calibers fit for. So that's the same bolt face as 6.5 Creedmoor, right. 308 Winchester, 762 yeah. by 51. But so. it'll, it'll probably have a wider body. No. So this well, is Well, okay, this is I wasn't cool sure. It. So you're going to be able to do it with the internal dimensions like I was talking about. So this round is the same cartridge overall length as 762 by 51 or 308. Right. Um, operates on the same bolt face diameter. Um, and so what we've been able to what we've been able to show is that you can actually take a gun like an M240 bell fed machine gun for the military crowd. You can take that weapon, um, take the 762 barrel off of it, put a, a 68 TVC barrel on it, which takes all of 3 seconds. And all of a sudden, that machine gun is now firing our 6.8 round. Well, in doing so, in making that change, you just extended the effective range of that weapon by 50%. Yeah, so it's just so everyone, like that 6.8's basically a 270. It's, this round is sending a 135 grand, our, our commercial configuration. At, at what kind of velocity? Like 3100, roughly 3100. I mean, that's insane. Second. That's that's really potent. Yeah. yeah. And what you got, like if you look at that, that uh, cartridge, it basically doesn't have a shoulder. It, well, it doesn't have a shoulder to neck to bullet. It's like all shoulder and then bullet. We call it we call it bull nosed. Yeah. Bull nosed. Yeah. There's there's not that that um, you know kind of classic uh, neck down. drop drop down into a shoulder to neck down to the neck and then and then bullet. It, it looks different, right? Yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and that gives you that extra powder capacity. Yeah. So I mean, for perspective, for most people, to get a one thirty moving north of three thousand feet per second, like you'd be in like a PRC, like a six five right. PRC type cartridge, right? Yeah. A short mag. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So to be able to do that in a, in a basically within the confines of like a 308 cartridge, basically unheard of. And to do it with a belt fed machine gun. Yes. It's pretty amazing. Well, and I mean, this is where, you know, the internal geometry of the case comes into play. I mean, you say there's no neck. Actually, there is a neck inside our 6.8 cartridge, but it is inverted. It's in, we've molded it into the neck or into the case body. Um, and, and you need that strength in order to really hold the projectile sure. stable and, you know, so you can resist. Especially going force. through. You just don't see When it's going gun. through on a saw or whatever, you know. Right. Well, there has to be some kind of neck or, or the bullet would just have that lateral movement yeah. as, right. you, as you touched it. You could sneeze on it and it would move. Um, but it's just really cool. So where else? So 6'8", 6'5", Creedmoor, 308, 5'5", 50 BMG. You said 338 Norma. So you're going to go Norma, not Lapua? Yeah, and that's that's based on military demand. I mean, you yeah. still see guys shooting 338 Lapua in the commercial market, but um, the military is moving towards 338 for, like, medium machine guns. Uh, and if you look at our offerings right now, I mean, obviously there's overlap. You know, we're introducing calibers right now that have both military demand internationally and in the U.S., but also that have yeah. a, a, a commercial application. You know, at Bass Pro and Cabela's, I mean, the, you know, the 556 and 223, uh, sales represent, you know, the overwhelming, I mean, they are by far the highest volume sellers in the, in the centerfire rifle, um, sector right behind them is 308. And then everything else kind of tails off from there. Um, so we're going to continue to introduce other calibers. I mean, I can't tell you how many people we were at Bass Pro's 50th anniversary deal, uh, up in Springfield, Missouri. And they're stocked in your ammo. Yeah. And I'll, I'll fill you in. There's some pretty cool news there too. Um, we were up there at their 50th anniversary event. I can't tell you how many you know, regular dudes came by our booth and asked if we had uh, 30 out six or yeah. 30 30. Like my dad continues to ask me, when are you coming out with 30 30? Well, I mean, to me, that seems like, like kind of obscure. You know, like you're not going to gain a whole lot of market share with 30 30. But if you think about it, there's a ton of rifles already in the market uh, that are chambered for those rounds. And so, you know, we'll go that path. Uh, the continue. development opportunity is there. Right. Those things. One thing that I saw um, when I was there, at least that I felt like might be a limitation or something uh, or a big problem to solve um, is, you know, my favorite cartridge is the 300 Win Mag and it's a belted case. Um, and so everything's, everything changes when you add a belted case to a polymer case mm -hmm. uh, and you try to mix the, the two things. Have you guys even looked at it, how to overcome that yet? Uh, we haven't actually started like prototyping. Sure. Uh, 300 Win Mag, but we have studied, you know, what the implications of a belted case would be on our technology. I think you could do it in the polymer. I, I mean, yeah, you know, because again, you still have the steel head. Yep. Uh, you know, so this, you know, molded around that. So I, I think though, you know, for what the belt is doing, 
It's I think you could. I think you could do that within the polymer. I don't actually think it creates too much of a complication. And it may just be. You mentioned the steel head. We call it the insert. That's the steel base. You know that gives yeah. you back end support. Um, you know that could it could be as simple as just changing the design of the insert for belted cartridges, yep. um, so that it's a little bit taller or yep. something yeah. like that. Sure, and we've already seen people kind of experiment with that, like a uh, using two materials there. So yeah, uh, that's doable. Um, so Bass Pro is a retailer for you guys. You guys obviously sell online. Yeah, uh, direct from the yeah. website. So we actually, uh, you know, when I started at True Velocity, the intent was defense support only. Uh, yeah. we, we had no intention of taking the product to the commercial market. That's changed. And that's really kind of my wheelhouse. That's where I've spent most of my career. Um, and so we made the decision about two years ago to launch a commercial line of True Velocity branded ammo. Um, the intent at the outset was sell it direct to consumer on our website only uh, and ultimately move towards like a subscription model, uh, which no one's really done successfully in the ammo industry um, up to this point. Um, but ultimately, as we, we rolled the product out, I think it was in July of 2021, so a little uh, year and a half or so ago, uh, we rolled that product out direct to consumer. We opted to pursue Parallel Pass 2, and so we put in place a distribution and a wholesale model, and we put in place a direct-to-retail model for some of the bigger guys. So, you know, uh, from the outset, we were selling direct-to-retail to Midway, uh, Palmetto State Armory, um, you know, a handful of, of premier um, retailers in the space. But Bass Pro and Cabela's were obviously an, the number one target for me. Yeah. And so, you know, we actually went about it the, the old fashioned way and organically got our product accepted into Bass Pro and Cabela's on a much faster timeline than, than, um, than most companies experience. I mean, I've talked to some colleagues in the industry who said it took them 10 years to get their product into Bass Pro and Cabela's. It took us about 10 months. Um, and so as of January of this year, they were carrying our product. Um, but fast forward to the last couple of months, and that's where we've really seen some awesome uh, developments with Johnny Morris and his team. Um, and Don, there's some backstory there too. Yeah, like you know, I was like, I, I was like, I know someone. Right. <laughs> when we were talking, I was like, you should, you guys should come down. And I was, I was getting their like, you know, conservationist of the year award for some of the stuff I'd done, you know, for you know, kind of combating the pebble mine thing up in Alaska. And I was like, hey, you know, you know, Pat, why don't you, you know, bring, bring the team up and, uh, you know, we'll sit down with Johnny. We're going to be there for a couple of days and just, you know, awesome experience. And you brought Kevin up, you know, and yeah. uh, sort of, and it, it went from there. But uh, you it, know, happened it, like, over, it happened over dinner. I was there. Yeah, it was, you were there. Yeah, yeah it, was, it happened over dinner. And, and you could see Johnny Morris like, we've got to do something with this. And well, that's, th this is the part that I think you got to talk about also, which is different than like, again, some of the other ammo guys where they have their two billion square foot facility somewhere. Like what you guys can do is all modular. You know, you can do a line of 308 out of a Connex box and literally send it there so they can, you know, essentially once assembled, you know, push a button and literally produce ammo on site Yeah, uh, from the raw materials. You know, obviously bullets are going to be, but like, the actual, you know, the polymer comes in little beads and it's getting put it in and mold injection in. Like they're pushing a button. You're watching it just crank out shells on site, which is, I think, just cool to watch. Yeah. I mean, I think it'd be like a, almost a feature at a Bass Pro shop. So you happen to also be getting ammo that you're then selling. But like who wouldn't watch that for a few minutes if you're an enthusiast? Yeah, absolutely. And so like there's, you know, the, that that design feature of our manufacturing technology was really geared towards military. I mean, so, yeah. you know, if you, you put you it in, in theater. Yeah, well, yeah. like right now we're building 95% of our military's small cal ammo in one facility in the middle of Missouri. It's Lake called Lake City. City. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that facility was commissioned in 1942. Like you go visit there today and it like looks, feels, and smells like 1942. Um, that seems to be like somewhat of a supply chain risk, you know, potentially for our, for our military. Uh, so the idea was, was create manufacturing technology that, number one, you can bring online pretty quickly. Number two is scalable. So this technology will scale up to medium and large cal, like tank rounds and mortars and things like that. Um, but also do it in a fashion where you can break the, the machinery down into its individual um, components, load it on one or two Connex units and ship it anywhere in the world where you got a generator and you're producing ammo. So picture, you know, yeah. the, ideal, uh, the, the ironic thing here is that three or four years ago, I would give this presentation to people who can visit us at our facility. And I, I would use the example of the Ukraine, um, unfortunately. Uh, you know, how, you know, who does the Ukraine buy most of its ammo from? Well, Russia. Who does the Ukraine That's buy not ammo to so potentially well, shoot? Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Who, does, who do they buy the ammo to potentially shoot at? Well, the Russians. That that doesn't seem to work very well. Um, this technology, you know, for a fraction of the cost of, of brass manufacturing cells, you could put these lines in place anywhere you want and give people their own sovereign 
manufacturing capabilities. Yeah, Ukraine obviously bought enough ammo to kick Russia's ass. Yeah. Um, but so let's, I want to get back to the 6.8 for a minute. Um, because in the consumer side of things, everybody is doing, you know, they're, they're looking at the 6.5 and they're looking at the 6.5 PRC. Both of them are incredibly popular. Um, the 6.5 PRC, obviously, obviously the advantage is that extra range you're yeah. going to get with the same bullet. With the 6.8 uh, that you guys are making, you guys are obviously, you know, you guys are obviously uh, testing that in, in rifles, center fire, bolt action rifles at this point. Are you guys seeing the same accuracy potential there that you have with the 308 or 7.62? Absolutely. And, you know, obviously certain cartridges uh, produce better dispersion results with different projectiles. So we're in the process of nailing down exactly what bullets we're going to load in the commercially available 6.8. I can tell you we've gotten some some projectiles at a Hornady that are performing extremely well. I mean, I'm talking half MOA or better accuracy. Yep. And then you've got the consistency of the muzzle velocity, which, you know, which Don touched on earlier. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on single digit SD, so less than 10 feet per second difference in velocity from one shot fired to the next. So the important thing there is that, you know, Don and I shoot some custom rifles and things like that. And a lot of them have custom loads worked up for them because factory ammo, uh, it, it, it's come a long way and it's very consistent now, but um, hand loading is, is usually the most consistent way to get the results that we're, we're looking for. With what you guys are doing, the consistency is ramped up there. Um, so I feel like this cartridge has the opportunity to, to really work its way into the custom rifle area where a lot of the custom rifle shops now, Gunworks, McCorder, whatever, you're buying a rifle and, you're, and they're loading ammo for you. And it removes a step. It takes some burden yeah. off of Gunworks or McCorder or somebody like that that builds you a rifle and ammo. 100%. If they can build you a rifle and and just maybe test it with, with your ammo and then ship the customer your ammo, that frees them up to just crank out more rifles. Uh, and they're not working yeah. on load development. You guys can you guys can, can shoulder the load development for them. Yeah. Um, and, and you have, uh, as long as it's consistent, they can make consistently accurate rifles. So I think, I think that has about as much potential as anything in the big game hunting cartridge world uh, over the next couple of years is to get that one to the consumer uh, and to the custom rifle makers with those rangers. 100%. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, that's we've given a lot of thought to that as well. And, and the way this 6.8 this round is going to roll out, you know, you're going to start to see some manufacturers introduce their 6.8 chambered guns, um, you know, this coming year. Some of them will probably have them at SHOT Show in January. Um, but basically, you go to the store and purchase, uh, you know, an AI rifle uh, chamber for 6.8. Um, inside your rifle case, there's going to be basically a unique um, QR code, so to speak. You're going to scan that code. It's going to take you directly to our website where you have access to subscribe to our 6.8 ammo being delivered direct to your door at a discount off regular MSRP. Um, and so, you know, we'll be we're working, you know, directly with these manufacturers to make sure that the cartridge that's associated with their rifle performs as good as we need it to. And, you know, that's going to be half MOA, single digit SD, you know, long range, tight accuracy potential. Yeah. That, that, yeah. And that's what's, I mean, I think that's what a lot of people don't get. Like when I started shooting long range, like before, before it was cool, like late nineties, you know, 600 yards was long range. Like today, right. like I don't even think of that as medium range. Like I don't, I don't have a gun that I'd hunt with that can't shoot 600 yards easily. You know what I mean? Like now you, you know, long range is, shooting two miles, right? Yeah. We're out shooting the ELR stuff and it, you know, but, even even a thousand's not even really long range anymore, and so you you it makes a difference. And for me, like if I can have that option where I I don't have to spend four hours on the bench to get a hundred rounds to that that will do it. Like I love that. Yeah, yeah I love that because I, I do like. I mean, I like reloading because I like the results I get from it. I don't like spending four hours at a bench. Well, you know, that's you know, I, for fifteen different guns that. Right. So, so we've done a good bit of, of collaborative work with Jake uh, Vibbert and John Pinch. I don't yeah. know if you know. So, yeah, that, some of the top PRS shooters like in the world. Yeah, period. I think I think they yeah. may be number one and number two. They're over. They're time. certainly all top five, basically. So we sat down with those guys and said, you know, what can we give you? And and basically, he said, time. You can, you know, I, I don't. I won't have to sit at my bench and reload two, you know, two hundred rounds for four hours the night before a match and stay up till two o'clock in the morning. Um, but also. You, it's ease. I mean, you get this level of consistency off the shelf and you don't have to invest in the equipment. You don't have to invest in the time uh, of, of hand loading your rounds. Now, I will, you guys know the hand loading crowd and, and you're, you're part of that crowd. They tend to, they're small, but they're very vocal. And so what we get well, from Everyone's them, got an opinion and they're right. often not right. Uh, you know, right. like uh, uh, very loud, often wrong, never in depth. And, right. and uh, racked with OCD. 
Exactly. Know? So yeah. a difficult person. And, you know, some of them just enjoy hand loading. I'm not going to argue with those guys. If it's a hobby of yours yeah, and you just course. like doing it, go for it. I like tying flies occasionally, but it doesn't mean I want to do it every time I every go fishing. Every time you fish, yeah. yeah. And so for those guys, the other two reasons beyond just enjoyment of doing uh, of doing it, uh, the other two reasons people hand load are, you know, perf- improve performance over what they can buy off the store shelf. Mm-hmm. And, and then also they think they're saving money. Um, now, That's more the biggest than not. falsity. <laughs> right. I've lost so much money saving money hand loading. It's right. hard to believe. So, I mean, we're giving them the level of performance they want, and we're giving them their time and money back. Um, in a in a, a round that's on the shelf at Bass Pro Cabela's. So for right now, a white tail hunter, um, those guys, you're already with those guys with the 308 ammo. Um, you know, well, Spencer killed his first, you know, deer with it. Like, you know, it oh, performed yeah, with, flawlessly. With, you know, like, and again. You know, I'm blessed to be able to kind of do whatever I want when it comes to that stuff and whatever. And I just wanted him to have a successful hunt. I had no issue. Just like here, right off the bat, like you're going to shoot this. So the rifle, um, the uh, Springfield Waypoint 308 that I first had and that Cole and I took to Africa is super accurate. That's with your ammo. It, That's where I'm going. Um, <laughs> super accurate with with your ammo. Um, had great results over there. Don was taking Spencer on a deer hunt. He was like, hey. Can I, he's like, I want to use one of our sponsored rifles. And that one also shoots the true velocity ammo. Can you shoot, can you send, send it to me? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I loan Don my rifle and Spencer kills his first deer with it. And I'm like, I'm de- and it's got a really nice loophole Mark five on it. Um, so it's got a very expensive optic on it. We're talking, you know, $4,500 rig at this point. And, um, and so I'm down at the cabin. I'm like, oh, there's my rifle. I'm going to throw that at my hard case and take it back. And Don goes, really? Uh, you know, Spencer killed his first deer with that. You're gonna take. He that thinks rifle. that's his gun. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna take that from him and like, and he just sold it so well. And I'm like, <laughs> damn it. Um, and so Spencer has a really nice rifle with really well matched ammo and a fine scope to go with it. Uh, in largely in part due to just how consistent it was with with uh, your ammo. It's never shot any other ammo actually. Not another round of 308. It, it didn't ever. need to because I was like, and I'll do that a lot also, which is why again you're not often saving. Uh, time or money, which is, you know, buy five different boxes of something and see what it shoots best. And again, yep. I'm not even looking at groups oftentimes. I'm looking at ESSD because I like to shoot far. Right. And like, I was like, okay, like done. Well, like, I got we the rifle. We, we look no further. I got the rifle uh, maybe five or six days before you sent me the ammo and I hadn't had time to shoot it. That was the first, that was the first uh, ammo I'd ever put through the rifle. And so it literally has never had anything else in it because I went out there, it shot half an inch. I ran it on a lab radar. Um, everything, it, I mean, it performed as well as you said it would uh, with deviation. And I was like, well, okay, I don't really need to do anything. And so it's never shot anything but true velocity. But I've got another Springfield Waypoint. It shoots that ammo just as well. Um, but for for the deer hunter out there, it's a, you know, I think 308, you know, reasonable ranges to kill a whitetail with a 308 would be, you know, you're pushing it. 350, 450, and you don't really want to run it too much further than that. But I'll say this. I shot it far just to kind of, again, for me, I I can't tell that much at 450, right? It, it's, it, you know, it, it's sort of post 6, 700 where you start seeing if it's really doing it. Because, you know, yeah. you have what you have on a chronograph and then you sort of verify everything, right? Yeah. I would, I with that 308 and that ammo, um, I was shooting four inch groups at 800 with a 308. And that's yeah. where you're starting to push probably like, almost getting subsonic. Yeah, you're And it was still like, I was like, I was like, that can't be right. I thought it was just like, you know, sometimes the paint just chips and it was like, that's a big black. I was looking at it, I was like, I had five rounds like this at at 800 yards out of a, out of like carbon light hunting weight rifle 308. Well, and, and I was like in Florida wind. Yeah. So I was like, damn, like, Keeper. And look, I mean, we understand the ballistics of 308 are not the sexiest yeah. thing in the world, but, you know, ultimately it's a, it's, Market share Consistency with a 308 is pretty sexy. The ballistics might not be, but the 6.8 will, will blow that out of the water once once we really get our hands on that. And Scobie did show me a video the other day of a buddy shooting an elk with a 6.8 Western. So uh, the 6.8 projectile will do it in the hands of a competent shooter. Uh, so you've got a long range whitetail, mule deer, antelope, you know, elk if someone's, you know, a, a really good shooter. Um, but this this is the one I'm going to be paying attention to over over the next year and really going to be spending a lot of time playing with it as soon as you guys can get us some. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I'll, like, be, I'll be getting a reamer. Like, yeah. Like tomorrow. Like, like, like now. Hey, like, did I, you bring I some with you? I was like, hey, like, just 
get me an AI barrel. I'll just spin it on one of my other guns and like, you know what I mean? Like I got no to start playing, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing to, to do would have been to have brought us some down here. Yeah, um, I mean, that you yeah, think like you if you're think. coming to someone's home. I mean, you're opening you know, your I mean, home I'm opening to my I, home. Hey, I, right? I, I was, like, I was you know, told to bring a toy to the party. So let's get zero. So, so look. For for everybody else, it's open bar for Pattis BYOB, um, and we'll just you know we'll just yeah. solve it like that. Yeah. Because um, you know we have to do something to to penalize this. When when can you guys realistically? We can go ahead and get the reamers, um, but when can you guys go ahead and get us some ammo for this thing? Now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well. And I mean, we'll get we'll tell you you know based on our research like what you know what are the manufacturers recommended specs. I mean, I'll tell you twist uh, everything you well, I, yeah you know that I'll know you know so, that, that's just going to be. Spin them fast and yeah. it'll be great. But uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be interesting. Well, if you're working with any other manufacturers, let me know because chances are I probably know someone there and be like, "Hey, I'm, I'm gonna you know test this stuff out. Can you spin me up something that'll?" There is up? a long list, and I'm sure you know some of the folks on there, so you can probably you can know them all pick. at this point. Yeah, but yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, um, we are pressed for time. Uh, your wife looks uh, good enough to show up to the Christmas party. Now you do not. Yes, you need does. to go get ready so you can match your wife. That's right. And we'll see you guys at the Christmas party at Don and Kim's. Awesome, Appreciate man. it, guys. Right, awesome. Thanks, for, thanks for coming on. Thank <laughs> you.